Welcome to today's Fireside Chat on Crushing Classical. Today we have a special guest, Sherry Allison, who is the executive director for a monstrously successful nonprofit in Canada. She is making waves and breaking the traditional mold in her approach to running a nonprofit. What sparked having Sherry on the chat was a chat that I had with Eileen about orchestra nonprofits. She pointed out how crazy it was that I didn't know how my employer or an orchestra nonprofit worked. And she's right. It is crazy to work for a nonprofit and not understand the business. Sherry worked with Eileen in the past. Eileen told me all about Sherry's work and how she personally revolutionized her own organization. And now she's making an impact on other nonprofits and how they approach fundraising. Now, what difference does it make to a classical musician? This matters if you plan on joining any orchestra. Nearly all orchestras are nonprofits and the decisions that they make impact your life and your income. Some key points you'll get from the show are how to know if the orchestra you're working for or want to work for is at risk financially, which could lead to strikes and lockouts as the worst case scenario or pay cuts and pay freezes in the meantime. The one question every orchestra should be asking themselves in order to get to the root of the problems, financial or otherwise, how to know if an orchestra management is failing and what to do about it, the significance of an orchestra's mission statement and why it should matter to you, how to declare yourself a catalyst for change in your own orchestra if it really matters to you. Now, it's not a new story to hear about financially struggling orchestras, but as a musician, what can you even do about that? I wondered that exact thing for so long in my career. This is really why I wanted to have Sherry on today. Sherry shares how she took her own failing nonprofit from ready to close its doors to thriving and more than doubling their annual budget within just over two years. She also suggests a revolutionary idea for how orchestras could raise money more money and raise it faster. It's pretty genius, actually, and will likely be met with tons of resistance. I'm really looking forward to you hearing this show. Let's get started. Ready. Hey, Eileen. Hey, Sherry. How are you? Good. Just great. Great. Okay, so today, this is the Fireside Chat, um, and Eileen is here, and we have a special guest, Sherry Allison, and you are a... A, you are head of a nonprofit in Canada. So I want you to tell us about what that nonprofit is. Yes, Tracy, glad to be here with you and Eileen. And I am the executive director of Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters in Miramichi, New Brunswick. And that's just in Eastern Canada. So we're here to talk about nonprofits. Yes, and I'm so excited. I've heard a lot about you from Eileen um, because you've worked with Eileen in a business coaching situation. And um, so she's told me all about your genius where nonprofits are concerned. And as as an orchestra musician, um, I'm ashamed to say that I don't really know so much about nonprofits and how they actually work. Like I know what they are. I know the basic setup of them, which um, actually I didn't learn until not that long ago. I mean... (laughs) Here I was playing in orchestras for the last 15 plus years. You know, they don't talk about that in school when you're, you know, at least when I was in music school, they don't even mention once what kind of business you're going into as a musician at all. So it's just, it's a thing that we don't learn. And so, so Eileen, one day we're talking and she's like, yeah, so do you get how this works? And I'm like, um... Kinda, and I I said some stuff, and she's like, "Yeah, that's part of the story." So, would you would you outline for um for the audience just how does a nonprofit operate? Like, what's different from a a regular business? Why you know what's with the name nonprofit? You know, all that kind of stuff. Sure, there's one answer for what is a nonprofit, and it's right in those two words, nonprofit. Nobody gains or gets a financial benefit when people gather in a nonprofit. Like profit corporates, they get uh, shares, dividends, or actual profit. But in a nonprofit, it's the total opposite. People come together to do something great, like an orchestra. Uh And any of the money that is raised 
is invested back in that purpose. Okay. So, so people who sit around a table as a board who oversee and govern, but they don't get any financial gain. It's purely nonprofit. So they're there for the interest of the cause. Whereas if you're on a corporation, you're looking from a shareholder value, you're looking for benefit and gain. Totally opposite in a nonprofit. I see. So the board is made up of, of um, volunteers, correct? Yes, volunteers, uh, people who serve without any gain. So there's no benefit to them other than seeing something great happen, whether it's musicians, it could be an animal shelter, something to benefit others. Okay. So who did you think you worked for, Tracy? So you're, you're a musician, you joined an orchestra. Who did you think your employer was? Um, the conductor or, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, <laughs> I knew that the conductor was the boss. But you know what's so great about that, Tracy? Is there's people on the board and they don't know either. They don't know you exist. Right. And, and they don't know why they do. So it's a, it's a wonderful collective of uncertainty. <laughs> Thank goodness it's called nonprofit for a reason. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of uncertainty, isn't it? Because everyone's separate, especially in an orchestra, so, so separated, you know, the orchestra does their thing and they, you know, they just, they know that what they're doing is important because their job is to, is to play the music and then the other people take care of the other stuff. So it's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of groups of people doing different things. And yeah, I didn't know who I was employed by. Honestly, I just thought, you know, the orchestra pays me. They raise money so that they can pay people. <laughs> and then we keep on going. And and then I honestly, this is embarrassing to admit, but um, and it wasn't recent. I mean, I did know that they had to raise money. But I remember being a young musician, being a student and going, oh, you mean they have to ask people to donate money in order for an orchestra to survive? Like that just... I didn't understand. I didn't know that that's what, I mean, I didn't know what the other way would be. I didn't, I didn't know how else it would work, but yeah, Eileen and I were talking about that one day. Cause we were talking about when we were in youth orchestra, like and no one, no one talked about it and it didn't occur to us to, to ask. <laughs> we just went, you know, to right. orchestra. Totally. So um, so you have the board and the CEO gets hired by the board. Is that right? Or, or how does the, how does the CEO get named CEO? The board has one employee and it's, and that would be the CEO. Okay. And then the CEO is responsible to deliver on the mission. In other words, the reason that the group is together, this case an orchestra, the CEO has to create the master plan and then make sure there's people in positions to carry out the purpose of that organization. And in your case, the musician. So the CEO would probably have um, other staff, maybe some managers, some directors, people who raise money, mm -hmm. but most importantly, out in the field, the musicians. And the CEO is the one point of contact for the board of directors. He or she is the board's only employee. Interesting. Okay. So, and the board, even though the board doesn't hold the purse strings necessarily, um, they're the employer of the CEO. So how does that work where you figure out how much a CEO gets paid? Does the board decide who gets, how much the CEO gets paid? Yes. The board is, they, they have a, a role of stewardship. They are responsible for any money that is raised for that organization. And they hire a CEO to carry out the work. So there's the controls are there, but mostly the budget is approved by the board. So if you're going to spend $5 million, the board would say, here's what we're going to do in 2017, 2018. Here's how much money it's going to take. We have to go raise it. Meanwhile, the orchestra has to deliver on the mission, playing the music, having the concerts. So it's a continuous loop of, of uh, accountability. But mm -hmm. the CEO is accountable to the board and the board has the authority on the budget. The CEO carries it out. Okay. So, um, the board is responsible for making sure that the budget is followed, but do they create the, the budget or is the, is the budget created by financial 
people within the, you know, maybe an underneath the CEO or something. And then they, and then the CEO presents it to the board to make yes. sure that what looks good. The CEO, okay. the CEO has to operationalize the mission. In other words, the reason they exist. So the CEO has to operationalize that. And it looks like a staffing structure, a marketing plan, a strategic plan, and a financial plan. And all of those come together in the boardroom for approval and direction. I see. But on the ground, the CEO is the one person who's responsible for making sure it all works. And so that person's critical in communicating so that the musicians know the plan for the coming year, financially how well things are going, and having that dialogue so that everyone is pulling in the same direction. So that that question, what might that, I mean, if you can like uh, give me an example of what line items might look like on a strategic plan for an orchestra like give me one or two like line items i just i'm just wondering what it looks like for an orchestra it it would start it would like for an orchestra it would be much like any other nonprofit you have your governance strategy in other words the makeup of your board of directors uh-huh. so there's terms for them so making sure that you have the right board to match the mission then you would have um A funding, a a huge piece would be the fundraising or the funding. Where are you going to get the money to do what you want to do? Okay. Once you get the money, you'd have a marketing strategy. How are you going to message the good work of the orchestra out to the community so they are inspired and say, I want to be involved. I want to give money to that. Mm. Much like any business model, so you'd have, and then you'd have your HR. So, what sort of a team do you need on the inside to make this work? And how many musicians do you need in your orchestra to put out a really great program? So, all the functions you'd have in any business also exist in a nonprofit. But I would also say most nonprofits don't realize that, and everybody walks around in a fog, not sure who does what or where they are or who should do what. So the confusions can be from the boardroom right out onto the, into the theater where the musicians are playing, like, just don't know. I feel that in orchestra for sure. So I, I have two questions from all the stuff you just said. First of all, you said, you said the right board, meaning like the right people on the board to carry out um, what the mission is, right? Is that what you meant by the right board? So how do you decide who's right on a board? You would look at, you would look for skills. Many boards are a friend of a friend or the friend who has money. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you that's the wrong board. You have to look at your board from a skills base. Do you need someone strong in legal, finance, marketing, fundraising? And you have to have a process so that you get those people in the room rather than say to Jane, oh, do you know the wealthy person on such a street? They'd be a great member for the board of the orchestra. They may never have heard from, they may not even know about music. Are they wealthy? Sure. But would that be a good match with your mission if they have never had an interest in, and so you're going to get that person in the boardroom with a point of view that could be just opposite to what the musician has for goals and, and, and believes what they can do. So you, if you don't carefully select your board based on an objective process, like skills based, you're going to end up with friends of friends, wealthy people without intent for the mission and all kinds of problems. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, I can see that. I can see that in many places where I look uh, in orchestras. Um, in the marketing thing that you had mentioned, um, and I, I know we're going to talk about more about marketing in a second, but you mentioned marketing as um, a way to get people in the community interested in the mission. So it's funny because as musicians, they think of the marketing as you got to market this concert I'm putting on because we want people to come to the concert. Like that's the one part. So you would say marketing is more of a two part or maybe multi part um, goal because not only do you want people to, in an orchestra situation, attend concerts, but you're saying also to put out into the community, hey, this is what we're about. This is something you want to be involved with. So it's like more than one thing you're marketing, really. 
Exactly. I think probably most orchestras market to people to come sit in a seat and listen. Mm -hmm. For an effective nonprofit orchestra, you would need attention on the quality of your work so that people would want to be on the board. You'd want attention from 14-year-olds who will stick with the music lessons mm -hmm. and, and aspire to be a musician where they can really develop that interest. And then you'd want everybody in the community to understand the orchestra. And when asked for money, they would give a little bit so that you wouldn't be just looking for 10 or 15 high level donors. You're looking for a broad base of support. So you want to tell the whole community because you never know where there's a surprise for support. Mm. You mentioned mission statement. And so um, what do you think makes a good mission statement in Sim general? Simple. People look at a mission statement, they're, instead of inspiring you, they're trying to impress you. Look at how many words are in our mission statement. And you read it and you think, what do they do? Your uh -huh. mission statement should very simply say what your purpose is. And anyone who reads your mission statement should be inspired by it. Volunteers, musicians, donors, whoever reads it, they should think, that's really important. That's needed. And therefore, that's your purpose. And they get it. Right. Mission statements in most nonprofits just confuse. They sound elaborate, but after six sentences, you still, you're not sure why they exist. Right. So it needs to be, it needs to be detailed, but specific so that you, people understand right away what it, what it's all about. That's right. They should be able to read it, get it, and remember it. Right. So sometimes I read an orchestra mission, and it's, and the mission is just to play music. <laughs> like, it's that kind of... I think maybe that could be a little more specific. I mean, they say something like, to play classical music at a high level. But that doesn't really... I, I could see how that wouldn't really interest someone who's not already in that community to know more. You know what I mean? So that's what I was kind of thinking well, about those mission statements because I, I didn't. Yeah, really care. yeah that that uh, I can tell you that a mission statement like that doesn't inspire me at all as a potential donor. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like you're just making the statement of what we already do, and the people who are already involved with us know what we do, and and we're not changing. That's it. You know, it's almost like putting that kind of message out. That's at least the energy I got from it. Not all the orchestras have mission statements like that, but a lot of a lot of them did when I looked it up. And it's not really a thing that it seemed like that it was really broadcast. You kind of had to search for it on the website. And in most nonprofits, they're buried. You can't find them. And I always say, if you have to search for it, imagine the people in the nonprofit, what kind of searching they're doing, because they don't have a clear vision of why they exist. Right. Yeah. And and it's always, it's always under about us on the drop down tab and you look for it and then you read it and you don't understand it. And you think, oh, they probably do good work. And you move on. You don't give them money. You don't give them time. You don't go to the concert. Right. right. And that, that you think that lends to that, um, scene you sort of described where people are wandering around and going, um, what are we doing here? What, what am I supposed to be doing? Kind of thing. Yeah, and nonprofits just continue to cycle through. People cycle through the board. They cycle through the CEO position. Mm -hmm. Instead of fixing the problem, they just keep moving the people around. Mm. Yes. And one of the very rooted problems could be, why do we exist? Maybe there's no need for us. That right? would be a hard question to ask, wouldn't yeah, it? I, I wonder how many nonprofits are asking that question right now. They're probably not. That's not asked at all. That's a scary question to ask, isn't it? Yeah, true, not just for nonprofits, could even be in business, right? Yeah. Isn't it better to take action and either change direction or close shop rather than just fade away and drift away and, you know, have courage? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, so back to the marketing um, discussion that we were talking about. So do, do nonprofits typically do much marketing? No. Okay, why is that? They have this myth in their head that they can't waste any money. 
as well, they expect that people think we do great work. So people just want to give to us. Right. And then, of course, then the, the conversation of no money starts to surface. Well, we didn't raise as much money. We didn't get as many out to the concert. You know, ticket sales are low. So then they start looking at that very immediate issue rather than saying, did we really get all our marketing strategies out timely in the right audience with the right message to get people to respond? No. The energy goes into sales are low, not many out to the concert. Instead of stepping back and doing a a 30,000 feet from the air, look down and say, maybe we could have done this marketing a little bit better. Yeah. So instead of, instead of saying the marketing wasn't right, they just blame the marketing. That was a waste of money. That's right. And they want it cheap. They either want it donated free. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they'll get something in print or maybe, um, let's say, I don't know if they use radio in the off hours, right? Because that's when you can get some free stuff and you can, so, so excited, you know, you got X amount of ads for free. Well, when did they air and what was the quality and nobody was listening. (laughs) So then you didn't have the people in the seats and then it wasn't a success and it just spirals from there. But no, unwillingness to spend money on marketing. Right. But on the other hand, um, marketing to make themselves look good is pretty important, right? Like, um, I wanted to know, you know, Eileen pulled up the annual report from our local orchestra just be, and I didn't even realize you could do that anytime you wanted on any nonprofit. And so it's on there and she was able to sort of read between the lines and see what's really going on. And, and she was explaining it to me that day we were talking about it, but, um, how much of the annual report report that's re, um, presented on the website is, is put in a way that makes everything look hunky dory. Like, Oh, everything's perfect. Look how great we're doing. We're doing amazing. I th- how awesome we're doing. Look at this beautiful colored pie chart we made. Right, exactly. I, I would say most annual reports are window dressing. They really sell it well really? out, the, out the window, but step inside the door and see if they can deliver on that annual report. Are they delivering? Or did a good graphic designer with a good marketing person just sort of put that together? And right. the, the real story is when you go inside the door. Right. Yeah. But they have to make themselves look good because they think, oh, you know, we have to look beautiful and attractive and and everything so that people give more money to us. Is that is that like the concern with that looking so good, would you say? that people, you know, they want to make sure they look good so that people give more money? Um, I, I think this whole idea of looking good, looking good is only going to last so long. Uh huh. People are very astute and they will look at the annual report, as Eileen just mentioned, and look, read between the lines. So people will give money when they can see that the organization is very effective. And it's often in very small things. How well the musicians feel that the communication is from the CEO's office. Do they meet three or four times a year to get updates on where the orchestra's going, what the plans are for the next two years, who is on the board, uh, the annual meeting? So the musicians are connected to the orchestra, not just their instrument. Right. And there's a gap probably between the people delivering on the mission, which is the orchestra, and the people in the boardroom or in the office doing the backroom work raising money, messaging, and coming up with a strategy. Yeah, there's a huge gap. Most definitely, I believe there is. Because musicians don't think, and it's on on both sides, you know, the musicians don't necessarily think it's their job to take this information into consideration because they believe it's their job to show up and play. But there's, there's a real disconnect there sometimes, I think, because you got the audience there too. And they're going, hey, we want to know, you know, their their communication is from the office, but then they show up to the concert and they're sitting in the audience looking at the musicians and they're not communicating with musicians necessarily. So there's these three parts, audience, office, people, and musicians. And, you know, I think also coming from the audience point of view, 
you know, they, they're thinking that the messaging coming from the office is what the musicians are saying. And it's not if no one's communicating between those two groups of people. So it's, it's very, it's too separated, I think. So those three groups, management, musicians, and orchestra have to be in the same room without any music, having a conversation. Mm -hmm. What do we want for the orchestra? You know, what is the plan in two years? Like, that has to happen in person. Yes. And I think they're very distinct bodies from what you're saying, that they get together for a concert, but they don't get together to plan the future of the organization. Absolutely true. They, they let somebody else do it. Mm -hmm. And it could be a CEO, and that could be a very effective CEO. Or what if you've got a poor CEO who's, not, who's running a very closed shop? Right. Who is limiting contact with the board, who isn't in communication with the musicians three or four times a year. So by limiting contact with the board, do you think the board and the musicians would be, it would be beneficial for them to know each other? I think there has to be um, an opportunity. They have to understand their roles. Uh -huh. and, and that's critical because the musician, you can't have musicians going to the board members. So as long as the, everyone right. understands their role, I think that you can get some really great, fresh ideas, some new ways of doing business. Right now, you're probably running an orchestra in silos. Musicians are over here. They don't really talk to management who's over here. And then somewhere out of sight is a board. Yeah. So those are three silos that work from a shared pool of money, but they don't talk about what they're going to do with it or how they're going to do something better in the coming year. Yes. Someone makes that decision. And wouldn't it be better if everyone had a, a voice in that decision? I think so. I would think but so. But many CEOs, many CEOs won't ask. They don't want to hear other voices. That's their style of leadership. They want to run the show themselves and not consult. So that is, that's a problem too. Yeah. Yeah. And then when the only time that there's a communication is when there's a negotiation for contracts, is sometimes... There, you know, you know, when it's, there's a situation where you haven't talked to somebody in a long time and maybe you're coming up with things that, you know, you think are happening in the other person's head without really knowing, you know, it can be, it, you can be entering into a situation that, you know, because of that lack of communication, you're guessing what the other person is thinking, you know, you know, you know, going into a negotiation, you know, the management doesn't want to pay people more, doesn't want to give more time off. And, and that's what the contract negotiation committee is there for. They're trying to fight for what the musicians want. So that's the only time where there's a communication when it's going to be like a battle of what can go in the contract, you know? Exactly. And, and in my work in fundraising, and as Eileen knows, I call that the Uncle Joe syndrome because you made a really good point, Tracy. You said they only talk when it's negotiations. In other words, they only talk when there's money needed. Yeah. And in fundraising, what happens, we ask people to give money when we are all of a sudden in a corner and, oh, we need help. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you had a dialogue, a, 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 a pipeline of healthy communication prior to negotiation. Yeah. That's your Uncle Joe. You go into negotiations when it's time to get the contract and the details of that and the money. But there's this vacuum up until then. Mm -hmm. and, and in families, you know, we all have families and all of a sudden, no contact, no, no uh, communication. But then if there's a need, you know exactly who to pick up the phone and call or send a, a text to. That's totally right. right. And you're going to have a much better response, a much better outcome, if it's continuous and honest long before the need is right on the table. So you almost set the contract negotiation up to be um, confrontational, competitive, yeah. you know. It's not a spirit of, how can we make this work? Right. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, sometimes there are situations where, um, you know, they made agreements and then uh, the, for the future, and then those agreements aren't met so that, you know, for example, like, um, hey, you know, I know that last new, last negotiation, we promised you that the next negotiation, we would give you a raise, but guess what? We haven't raised that money. So 
here we are at the next negotiation and we don't okay. have the money. That's a great point. And the question that has to be asked, why have we not raised the money? And that starts long before that negotiation period. Right. And that goes right back to the board and the CEO recognizing that without an orchestra, there is no nonprofit. The orchestra is the mission. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't only talk to them when it's negotiation time. (laughs) I know. And so do you think the Uncle Joe syndrome also applies to just asking donors for money, people waiting till the moment where, uh, we're at our deadline where we were supposed to be, we were supposed to have met our, our goal of, you know, a million dollars and we've got 200,000. And so now I got to call uncle Joe, right? It's, is it like that too? Absolutely. Because most of the donating or the giving happens in the last three months of the year, which is our tax year. Mm. And, but how surprising it would be to be asked for money, let's say in April or March or all year long, rather than this race to the finish line for the tax deadline, which is a benefit of course for the donor. But maybe there's something in June that's inspiring. Right. But they don't have to raise the money till the end of the year, so they'll start that in October. (laughs) Yeah. And I think there's something to be said for being asked to donate from a, from a, you know, a desperation place or just from an inspiration place. Well, you could ask yourself, do you want to give money to something that is struggling on the edge or do you want to give something money to an organization that is like really doing great work? Everybody knows about them and you're really proud to belong or support. Right. I mean, we're all human when it comes to what we have to give away. Right. And you you want to give it where there's the best benefit. Well, and also, so right. if, if you were a donor, a in team. everybody wants to be on a winning team. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's right. totally. I think that's part of it. Sorry to interrupt you, Sherry. Go ahead. So it's very true. Everybody wants to give where there's success. Right. Mm -hmm. So in your, in your case, talking about an orchestra, if the conversation in the coffee shop is about how they're in negotiations and management is this, that leaks out into the community and people have just think, Oh, I don't know if I'd want to go to that. Oh, I don't know if I'd want to be on that board. Mm -hmm. That's, that's your mission out there. And that determines your level of support. The conversations you have get you the results that you have. That's interesting. And that's, it it makes it seem how much more widespread it is. It's not just, you know, the problems aren't just these little micro problems, but really it spreads when you think about it like that everywhere. Hey, can I Um, I ask a question? So, you know, you have, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh yes, please. So Sherry, I'm curious about something. So, There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of articles that are published. I say a lot. I mean, it's a pretty good number of articles that have been published that say classical music is dying, orchestras are dying. Like there's, you know, people publishing this rhetoric out in the world. And then there's whatever the orchestras are saying themselves. How much does that kind of propaganda affect um, people's willingness to give? to donate to an orchestra, to financially support an orchestra, or to even go to concerts? Like how much, how much of that? Cause you know, that propaganda is written by music critics or written by um, just, you know, critics in general, or, you know, uh, people who are interested in classical music who think it's dying. I'm just wondering what you think about that. How does that, cause I realize there's a conversation inside the organization, but then there's also another, in the case of orchestras, there's another conversation going on out there that's not necessarily controlled by the orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, I would say it has a lot to do with people aspiring to be musicians because they feel it's dead-ended, there's no opportunity. Okay. So there's that risk. And that messaging also is getting to people with money in their pocket and thinking, oh, it's kind of waning. So I think it is probably crushing the, the orchestra scene. Okay. Because people read headlines and sound bites and they, and they hang on to it. Yep. That's what I was wondering. I mean, that's seriously. That's and, what and it just starts, it starts to spiral because it's that old bad news syndrome. Once it starts to get out there, people all believe it and don't dive into it to say, gee, I wonder what it's like in our community. And they'll just quote this generalized opinion and then 
that propaganda just continues. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking more for young musicians feeling hopeless that there's no opportunity for them. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, they, I think, um, yeah, that is. And, and you know, like you said, um, when you when you read those articles and you see, oh, yeah, orchestras, they're not doing well, but then you hear about um, the musical Hamilton, um, you know, just going crazy in New York City and, you know, lots of small cities. I know there's a big um, there's a big musical um, situation here, too, like not necessarily Hamilton, but there are musicals here every all going on all the time too. And, you know, when people are getting ready to donate their money, if they're thinking about donating to the arts, there's lots of options. They can donate, you know, to, you know, private arts organizations, museums, the ballet, the opera, you know? And so when deciding to give their money, if that's a position that they're in, um, and they read these articles, they might go, Oh, I'm not going to give my money to a sinking ship. Maybe. And, and I think the ship that's sinking is probably on the inside of the nonprofit because I think as people, we are even more interested in live performance, live music, even though we've got iTunes. And I think that's just a part of our humanity. I think there's a market there for live performance like we have never experienced it yet. I agree. And I think I would take it back inside the nonprofit and say, what needs to be fixed here? Because we have a really great piece of work. And why should we be letting a report in the New York Times or a headline wherever dictate our capacity? Because I'm telling you, as humans, we crave live performance. I agree. I think so, too. Um, there's just so many different kinds you can do. And, and I think a big part of it, which is a whole other conversation, and we've talked about it a lot on Crushing Classical, is just making yourselves relevant in an orchestra. And so that a lot of times um, this is a conversation also that comes from the management because they are scheduled. This is they're they're choosing repertoire based on what the big donors want to hear, necessarily not thinking about um, growing the audience base. So like they know that, you know, the biggest donor of the year loves Beethoven. Well, let's schedule a couple Beethoven concerts this year or whatever. And then it's just pulling that out of thin air, you know, um, not thinking what's a cutting edge thing that we can do that will, that will bring a whole new group of people in this city to the, to the symphony, or what's some kind of concert series that we could start that would, that would bring in the millennials or, you know, questions like that that don't get asked, they they sort of they sort of cater to the people who are handing over the big bucks, you know, and that's keeping it kind of small too, I think. And and that's probably a fundamental flaw within the structure of the organization. The big donor voice is the one calling the shots, and I think that's time for the musicians to ask the CEO, "Do you believe the orchestra is dying?" And then Ask that board, what's the future of our orchestra? Do you think it's waning? Mm -hmm. And if it is, get rid of the CEO and the board. That would be hard. Would you think that would be hard to do? Get rid of all of those people and start over from scratch? It's possible. Have you seen it before? In yes. In a nonprofit? Really? Absolutely. If there's a will of the people who really believe... They can sit down and come up with a strategy to make your orchestra robust. Mm. Is it easy? No. But listening to a couple of big donors and, and that expression, calling the shots and dictating the program, that's not the best model either. Maybe that's why performances are not as full, because they're not appealing to the wider audience. They're appealing to the interest of a select few. Yes. And, you know, sometimes they're thinking about money, too. Like, oh, what's the cheapest thing we can put on? You know, like if there's less musicians on the stage, that costs less money or something. You know, they, yeah. they and might... you'll raise you'll raise less money. You take the cheap street and you'll get the cheap results, just like in marketing. If you want it for free, you'll get it for free, but you won't get the results. Mm -hmm. You want to pay less musicians, you'll get less great music and less great performances. But you'll have done it very cheaply. 
And the wealthy donor will be able to look at it and say, see, we, we're very uh, frugal. You know, we're not wasting money. Mm-hmm. You're not growing and you're not meeting the need of the community either, nor are you inspiring musicians to be in your orchestra. Yes. So would you say this goes into the, um, from your report, you, you have a really great report on your website that I read about this stuff. And um, one of the things you talked about was the head in the sand mentality about money. Would, would you say that what we're talking about now is basically that? Certainly. I mean, that head in the sand mentality exists everywhere. It exists in our personal lives, like avoiding the real issue around money. Yeah. That it takes money to make things happen. You have to invest and you do it with your money. Then you have to be um, conscious of return and, and the quality of the outcome. But you have to put the money on the table and believe it's worth it. Yes. Right. And not be afraid to spend where you need to spend in order to see new results. You have to spend new money to f- do things differently. Yeah. So tell me about um, the time that you... I this. In this money conversation, you were talking about when you're in in the report, you were talking about when um, your own nonprofit was really struggling and you you did an amazing thing. You gave money first. Tell me about that. Yes, I did. But here's the story on that. Our organization thought we were doing the right thing. We we took a risk. We, We took a new venture. Uh huh, and it failed, and the failure of it was was a huge financial hit, and we laid off staff, and you know everything was like a thirty day, we're down and out. Oh. And as the executive director, I thought, what is my role in this, and what is the future? Walking away and putting the lock in the door, easy, but going on a new path, and so we had a board meeting to fold everything up. And before that board meeting, I went to a donor in the community and said, I'm going into the board meeting and I'm going to put $5,000 of my own money on the table tonight. Will you match it? And he said, yes. So I go into the board meeting and I said, after all the conversation around the table around, we will lay off staff and here's our phase out plan. And in 60 days, we will have ceased. And I said, I believe there's a future and I'm going to put my money on the table to match that belief. And I said, I'm committing $5,000. I have a donor who has already committed. And I said, what are you going to do? Was it risky? Was it gutsy? Yes. But that's what it takes when the chips are down and your future's at stake. And just that one act caused the others who, if you were to profile them, They had never given a significant donation. And seven or eight people around that table all matched that donation. And we turned a corner. It wasn't about the value of the money or the amount of the money. It was about the conviction around the belief that our mission was worth it. Wow. And that was a game changer for us. And it was a leadership moment that changed everyone around that board table. Wow. And what happened after that? Well, within 60 days, anyone who had been in a layoff was back in. We had a new program menu and we had sat in the boardroom and said, next year, this is what we'll do for fundraising. These are the risks we'll take. And we were um, cautious because that was a real, uh, nosedive. I mean, we really hit rock bottom, but we were cautious, but we were super diligent and we just have gone straight up since then. Like our growth trajectory straight up. We have never looked back. It gave us a foundation that we would never have had without that moment where we looked our mission, where we looked our mission right in the face and said, it's worth it. That was when you asked your own self and and everyone else that worked there, um, was it dying or not? You know, you asked that tough question essentially right then and there. Absolutely. It's easy to walk away. It's much more difficult to stay and do the heavy lifting. But when you do it and it works, there's nothing like it. Nothing. 
Far better than going to a donor and getting a million dollar gift. It's not about scale. It's about the effort and the belief that this is worth working for. Wow, that's inspiring. And so you just said to me that um, that there were people who hadn't given before in that moment. So that's that's interesting because typically I think what you do is you go after the people who've always given. We do. We have a short list of big givers at a certain level and we put, it's like a pyramid, they're at the top. We always go after them and ask for like a, a large donation. Mm -hmm. When in effect... There's people who you have never asked with, with, without any reason. You just decided, oh, no, they wouldn't be on that list. You profiled them. But surprisingly, when you give them the opportunity to give, it, it, it's, it's always a surprise. Because every community and every nonprofit looks at who are the wealthy people or who are the people most likely to give. Totally. Mm -hmm. And they avoid or, or neglect all the other people. They do. And I mean, very few people when asked will say no. They just need to be asked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I know some, I know the ballet here always asks, like there's like an envelope in every program, especially around nutcracker season, you know, because that's the biggest money maker for them. And they know that it's a tradition to take everybody to the nutcracker at Christmas time. So they always ask. You know, sure. But it's not as common. I've seen um, just in general to ask for smaller amounts. So and you've seen that to be really beneficial. Well, you you created this really cool um, program in your town called the Gold Rush Method. So can you tell us about how you did that or what that is? Sure. Much. And, and this this is a great lead into it, because. We all want to raise the most money with the least effort or the fewest number of donors giving a maximum amount. And, and I looked around the community and I just thought, how do I get a whole group of people, like hundreds of people, giving a much smaller amount of money frequently? Uh -huh. Because I had looked at employment and I mean, all of our communities go through these trends of, of recession and that. And I thought, what would be recession proof? Uh -huh. And I thought something that's affordable and weekly. And we came up with this project and it's a 50-50 where you put $2 in every week. And our goal, as I've shared with Eileen, was to get 500 people in a community to do this. And I took it to the board and it was very visual. And I had, it's, a, it's basically it's a box. You put a, a, a coin in it every week, a $2 coin. And then you, uh, you wait for like that week, there's a draw. And you get half of that money. So there's something in it for you as an individual. You get half of the proceeds. The orchestra or the nonprofit gets the other half. Mm -hmm. My goal was 500. And I thought, this is great. Cash flow, good. this will have a good impact. We launched it in May, actually. And so we're up to our sixth anniversary this month, six years. And we have 41,000 people playing this game. Oh my gosh. So it wasn't the growth we forecast, but it's the growth that we have been running with because it has enabled us to not only secure our future because we created a charitable foundation, uh -huh. but it has en enabled us to do a whole menu of programs and activities that would never have been possible if we had just continued to look for those top dollar donors who would give a significant gift every year. We went from 500 people saying yes to 41,000. That's incredible. That is incredible. So we went from an annual budget of under a half a million to a budget of 2 million. Wow. And, and it's, it, the model is fascinating because it turns nonprofits upside down. Nonprofits put all the energy into major gifts, big donors, and this one puts all its energy into $2.00. And thousands of people giving at that level. <laughs> That's really smart. And so you just you just brought up something else, the foundation. Yes. So, so what is that? Um, as we talked about nonprofits, the money that comes in has to go back into the mission. Mm -hmm. So you want to get your nonprofit position so that you're not only eating today, you have enough money to eat tomorrow. 
And that's what the foundation does. In other words, it is like a rainy day fund that is separate in your nonprofit for sustainability. So let's say you have a concert or a, or a performance that doesn't really bring in a lot of revenue. There's a cushion there. Mm -hmm. So that you're not in this nosedive all the time of survival and scarcity. There is an opportunity there. I think we have the next three years secured while we continue our regular fundraising. Right. And most nonprofits live hand to mouth, like they're eating today and have no idea next month where that money will come from. Right. And so so they're always chasing the money, right? Yes. Yes. Always. So is a foundation similar to a, um, endowment or is that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The same. It's an investment strategy for you to take a a chunk of money and invest it so that you keep your principal. So you don't have a loss and you also get a a nominal interest and it's basically a safe investment. Right. Okay. And then you can use the, the money from the interest to operate. That's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Well, you know, so after I learned about your method, um, I, I did a little research to see if that people do that here. And I know each state in the U S has different laws. And in North Carolina, you are only allowed to do a raffle twice a year. (laughs) So I thought, wow, that's, that's a bummer. And then, and then there's all these different rules about how much money it can raise and all these different things, even if it's for a nonprofit. And, um, I'm sure, I'm not sure about the other States. I know that, I know that they have a lottery for like raising money for education, but I'm pretty sure that's, you know, maybe statewide or even multi-state. So it's not as small as yours. And that's, what's cool about yours is it's, it's really for the community that you serve. That's right. And it's interesting when you look at these lotteries and you made a good point, Tracy, state uh, control or state law. And of course, there's a bucket of money in community and the state is going to control Mm -hmm. who gets the largest share of that. So the sector, other nonprofits have to start essentially um, having the conversation with the people who make those rules and say, maybe there's a chance for us to get beyond survival mode here and get a different way of raising money if you would just lessen the rules yes to get us a share of that pie yes because now we're looking at um you know they're they're looking to defund the national endowment for the arts which is the endowment that's supposedly taking care of all the arts in the entire country you know so that's really large like you said it's not serving each individual community everyone's there's arguments that some, you know, some arts organizations benefit more from the endowment of the arts than, than others. And so that's why they don't care if it gets defunded. And there's other people that really benefit. They don't want it to go away. And it's, again, putting the power, you know, in, in the larger government and not focusing it on community. So if this is if this is going to happen, people need to take more responsibility for their own communities like you've done and. And when it's made smaller like that, I can see why people would be more willing to give if they're on a smaller level, like the $2 um, version that you have. You know, if it's if it's serving directly your community, the people that you see every day when you walk down the street, that's it's so much more impactful and inspiring to give money to it. Exactly. And uh, organizations need to raise money. So whoever has the rule book, your, that's where your board and your CEO come in. They have to say, this is important enough that we want to ask why this rule exists. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's time to change the rule. But you have to start with the question. And that's where boards and CEOs step back and say, oh, well, that's the way it is. Right. No, that's not the way it is. Yes. So a lot of your success comes with your CEO and your board because how they relate to your musicians is going to speak about the health of your organization. Yes. You shouldn't just be in conversation when it's negotiation time. There has to be conversations throughout the year. I thought your point about the Nutcracker story was really good. So in the theater, when they go to the performance, there's an envelope there for them to give, right? Yep, and before every single Nutcracker performance, the the head of the ballet comes up and says, you know, thank you for being here for the Nutcracker. You know, we love that you come here every year. And, you know, next month we have Cinderella and the girls 
all the little girls here might like that. And in three or four months, we have this or that. And thank you for supporting the ballet. And even a little bit of money will help us keep this going. And da 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 da. Every, yeah, and every just single to, one. Just to try, I think that's a good strategy, but I think there might even be an, a better opportunity if in September, October, everybody was encouraged to give so the nutcracker would break all records. So you wait till they're in the seat before you ask. What have you lead up to the event, right? Right. That's a good point. So, I mean, those are the kinds of strategies that have to happen in the room where the management sit. Yeah. Because I think it's too immediate, our ask for money. It's like when they're in the theater and then we say, oh, and don't forget about Cinderella and don't forget. They just got what they wanted. They want a nutcracker. They're going home. <laughs> yeah. So they don't care where Cinderella is. <laughs> That's true. That's another marketing strategy that maybe uh, could be looked at. Well, it's the timing, right? Like everyone's excited for the Nutcracker. So start pre-Thanksgiving or, or, and talk about the Nutcracker. And, you know, you could sponsor so many seats for kids at such a school to go. And it would be a real moneymaker. Right. Right. And I know that I always think, yeah, okay, here comes the guy to ask everybody money. We're just waiting for the nutcracker to start, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And everybody tunes out, looks around or checks, wishes they had their phone. And he just gets his little piece of information out and nobody remembers what he said. Kind of like that mission statement. Yes. Yeah. So that's another example of, of a, a way that a nonprofit could improve. Are there any other... Um, Things that, that I haven't mentioned, do you think that um, that could be improved upon in general, like that you see that you see in nonprofits that are continually, um, you know, being overlooked? I, th I think it just starts with some very simple things. When you, you know, when you talk to staff or musicians or everyone just steps into that blame syndrome, they blame, well, there's not enough money. Well, you know, we don't have enough musicians. If they just reverse that conversation and say, what's my role here? What should I be doing to make this different? If I don't like it, how do I change it? Mm -hmm. And there's just an unwillingness. You know, I even see with board members, they're on the board and they just kind of flounder, get lost, and then they disappear. Well, why do they leave? Mm. And that's a question that a good CEO is going to ask. Why do some board members leave? Do an exit interview. Understand what was it about how they worked together or didn't that caused them to go out the door. Because everyone who goes out the door, there's a direct cost for you. Yeah, so just it boils down to communication, really, doesn't it? It does. It, it boils down to why are you here? Yeah. Between and if you don't know why you're here, then we've got to figure this out. And then you'll make your decision. Maybe you'll leave. But maybe there's something that you don't know that would make you more effective and valued and want to be here. Yeah, that's great advice. And then after that, people have to take action when they find out what, what's going on. You know, after the communication happens, then you do something with that information. Well, I, you know, musicians, I know they're there to play the instruments, but what's their role in fundraising? They have a network of people. That's absolutely true. So when, when you, um, and you've said, you said in your report that, um, that you think fundraising is everybody's job. It is everybody's job. It's it, everyone from the front office to the president of the board. Everyone has to have a connection that they can either ask for money or access money. Mm -hmm. And they have to be willing to do that. And if they're not, they're not serving their organization well, because without money, the organization cannot fulfill its mission. Yes. The, music the musicians won't be paid the scale that they, they deserve or, or is equitable. Well, why? Because they haven't raised enough money. Well, whose job was it to raise the money? All of us. I bet people don't necessarily like you uh, saying that, huh? <laughs> I don't know. I don't listen to them. You could have just, just <laughs> stopped that. You could have just stopped that. So people, so people probably don't necessarily like you. You could have just stopped it right there. <laughs> not just, not just people don't necessarily like you. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the only thing that Eileen does. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time because I know how. I love, I love to mess with you because you're such a contrarian when it comes to 
Like you're such a different non, like you're so different as a CEO of a nonprofit than most than most CEOs would be of nonprofits. That's what I'm saying. Well, that's very kind of you. And thank you. <laughs> well, I think it's awesome. And so one of the things I wanted to ask Eileen, because we talk about, we talk about this so much, Eileen, is the idea of sales and being good at sales and it, being able to enroll somebody in your idea. Um, if it were to become everybody's job, literally, like musicians were going to um, be you know, ask to be a part of this, it would start with communication, as you've been saying, and, um, and that people would all be on board with this mission. And, and recognizing that we're not trying to make things operate cheaper all the time, but that we're actually trying to create more income, create more money coming in. And if it is everybody's job, we have to get some um, skills, some real skills in place, because you can't say tomorrow, hey, musicians, it's time for you to start asking people for money. Like that might really turn out bad if people don't know how to talk to people and ask them things, you know? Well, that's what's but really- your, your CEO of your nonprofit can help with that. They can get, uh, yeah. Well, I agree with you, but here's what I'll say too. Ahead, I mean, it's kind of pathetic. It's kind of pathetic when we say, well, we shouldn't expect the musicians to go out and ask for money because they don't know how to ask for money. What are you talking about? When you're a child and you want something, you know, you walk in a store with your mom and you're like, you want candy? What do you say? Mom, can I have this candy? That's what you say. I mean, everybody acts like asking for things is foreign. You know, I, I don't get that. We've been asking for things since we were kids and suddenly we've forgotten we have to teach people how to ask for things. I'm not saying there isn't a skill involved in sales or enrollment or whatever. I'm not saying that. But we make it a lot more complicated than it really is. And musicians thinking, if they do think, that it's not their responsibility to ask for money to support the orchestra they're in, they're out of their minds. They need to get their head out of their ass. That's my opinion. <laughs> Well, well said. Well said. I mean, well, it's true. Can we all just? It is true, what, and it's. Well, like? No, you're absolutely right, Eileen. And if it, but if it were to come down to it right now, where you know that's it's going to be stated that everyone needs to be part of raising money, uh, that would that would disrupt some things. That would put people's head in a tizzy. God forbid. Say. God forbid. We should put. Not that that's a bad thing. Tizzy. Well, let's put their head in a tizzy for a change instead of wringing their hands about. Oh no, we can't do that. I agree. Right. 100%. Right. right. I agree. Like, Why? oh my, because we can't. Oh, we, right. you know, and let's go to the tis. Yeah. Yeah. So it's time to make that shift and disrupt that. And, you know, I think of this, the name of your show, your podcast here, Tracy, Fireside Chat. Mm -hmm. That's what nonprofits do all of the time. They sit like they're at a fireside where it's comfy and cozy and don't dare ask the tough questions. Yeah. So I, I couldn't help but think when you have your, your title of your podcast, I thought, wow, that's how most nonprofits live, right by the fireside where it's comfy, yep. safe. There's marshmallows and fire. Right. Meanwhile, things are, not, things are happening that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. Oh, look, there's a unicorn. <laughs> We better build a fence around our, we better build a fence in our back. A unicorn dancing in the flames. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Well, there's a lot of unicorn thinking in the orchestra world, isn't there? We talk about that a lot. Oh, God, yeah. That's great. Well, I love this. You know, I, I hope lots of people get really upset when they hear that because I would love to hear what people have to say. I'm all for it. I'm all for um, making this an actual group effort instead of pointing the finger and saying, hey, you guys didn't raise enough money. So now I don't have enough money for my raise this year or whatever, you know. Exactly. And then what happens, okay, this is going to really piss people off, but and then what happens is the musicians go on strike and it's, oh, poor us, woe is us. Can you believe that the management are cutting our health insurance or this or that or the other. And then they go and they pick it. <laughs> I would really want to give money to that orchestra <laughs> so they could buy new signs, placards. <laughs> I know. I know. It, and like, you know, I, people are people, this is not a popular thing to say because, you know, you have to support the musicians. 
as a musician, you have to be supportive of the musicians. I support musicians. I do. But I don't like the the way that it, that goes. Every time it's so predictable, you know. Oh, this orchestra is losing money. It's the management's fault. The management uh, locked out the musicians. They can't work. Now the musicians go on strike. That's kind of a repeated histor- historical story. Wait, wait a second, though. You just said, well, that storybook should get to the last chapter. And you should. Yeah, I don't. Uh, it's interesting what you just said, Tracy. You wow. said, I, th- I think we need to support musicians. Why do you think that? Why do we have to support musicians? What do you mean? I said, I, I said that probably what I'm saying is going to per- be perceived as I'm not supporting the musicians. Because whenever, whenever um, an orchestra goes on strike, well, then there's all this news and you have to support the musicians. And yeah, they're, know, they're saying, know, support us, support us, support us, I be know. on our side. I know, but you just got, I know, but you just got done saying, I believe in supporting musicians. I think we should support musicians. And I, and I'm asking you about that. Do you really think we need to support musicians? Why? Support them in a way that, that, uh, helps them see another way is actually what I meant by that. And as a, as a musician myself, I wouldn't want to say that I don't support musicians, but I want, I support musicians to start thinking in a new way. That's really what I mean. Okay, yeah, because I was going to say, I don't, I mean, I don't think the purpose of giving money to an orchestra is to support musicians. I think the purpose of giving money to an orchestra is to support the mission. Oh, no, I I totally agree with that. Okay, yeah, I just misunderstood what you said. So I was like, wait a second, what do you, because I I, I don't think think musicians need to be supported. I don't necessarily, it's their job to support themselves. The fact that they're deciding to play in an orchestra, that's a choice, you know. Oh, absolutely. No, no, I... I completely agree. And that's what I'm saying. Like I, when I start to, when I see these situations where people are being locked out and then they're, they're on strike and then they expect everyone to support the musicians. So that's maybe, I'm glad you're bringing this up because what it's, what it's pointing to and I'm seeing now is that maybe a lot of times musicians don't think that they're, um, that the point is to support the mission. Maybe they, they think that everyone's supporting them, you know, so that could be um, a skewed point of view, actually. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what they think, but that's a possibility. I feel like I'm eavesdropping on a board meeting. (laughs) (laughs) Do you really? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) That's funny. So Tracy, is there any, are there any other questions you want to ask or is this, is well, this are we, are we, it's complete? a fascinating, I think we're complete. This was just a great way to end the, the conversation because um, it launched into a whole other kind of, kind of conversation that, you know, we can, we can continue. I can continue on social media for sure um, because it's fascinating to me. I'd like to actually get to the bottom of that. What musicians think the support is for. And maybe the maybe the lack of detail in the mission statement is the root of the problem. Who knows? I don't know. But there's this is a big conversation. I'm realizing we just opened up a huge can of worms. So, but we've had the courage to have it, and that's what's so important. Yes, absolutely. So thank you so much, Sherry, for being on today. What you've brought to the table is is mind boggling and so so um, valuable. I'm I'm really excited that you are here today and. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and if um, if you're enjoying the fireside chats, please keep listening and um, join us on social media at facebook.com slash crushing classical and Instagram at crushing classical. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you.